This is the Amp Hour Podcast, recorded October 14th, 2012. Episode 117, with guest Alan Wolke, Undulating Utensil Utility. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Dave Jones from the EEV blog. And I'm Chris Gamble of Chip Report TV and Chris Gamble's Analog Life. And I am Alan Wolke from Techtronics and YouTube and the wonderful world of ham radio. Welcome, Alan. Yay. A fellow hey. video blogger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not, not quite to the extent that you are there, Dave, but uh, well, it I is certainly have fun with job, it. You know. That's I mean, true. <laughs> so I've got to churn the videos out, but uh, no, right, you do right. some awesome. Uh, you do technical YouTube videos in terms of tutorials and oscilloscopes and because yeah, you're a scope man, aren't to... you? You just love your scopes and your spectrum I, analyzers. I do, I do, I do. Yep. I've, uh, I, I think I played with my first scope when I was in high school, and uh, and then I, I worked in a TV repair shop, and I was hooked. I just, you know, you know like, right. <laughs> that was it. That was uh, that kind of spelled the rest of the future for me, I guess. Hang on, you had a you had actually had an actual oscilloscope in high school. What luxury! We actually, yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, we, we actually had a uh, electronics lab in oh. high school, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the first scope that I actually played with was, was an old Allen B. Dumont cathode ray oscillograph. And, uh, and it was just one of these old recurrent sweep scopes with a big green worm trace on it. And uh, when the high school was getting rid of it, I picked it up. <laughs> oh, and nice. uh, and I, I, brought, I promptly brought it home and hooked it up to my stereo. So that was like the first, you know, <laughs> first thing that I did with a scope. But uh, I guess when I was a junior in high school, I started working at a repair shop and had a proper 465, you know, Tektronix 465 scope that I yes, used uh, yep. on the bench. And uh, yeah, after that, I was I was kind of yeah. hooked. So I, I was always kind of from that point forward, you know, kind of where the rubber meets the road. You know, let me see what's going on with the stuff. You know, <laughs> that type of thing. So, could you tell us about that that repair shop time? I mean, uh, just start from the sure. beginning. I guess. Uh, I mean, what yeah, was that like? Uh, like what time frame was that? If you're comfortable telling us, and uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. what yeah. were some of the things you're doing? <laughs> I mean, because that question. sounds like a really good. It was before you were born, Chris. I think so. so well, a lot of things probably... were, but yeah. Yeah, it was probably uh, I probably started there in 1977 or 78, um, mm. probably about that mm-hmm. time frame. Uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was probably 78, so it was probably sophomore or junior in high school. Okay. And I, you know, I newspaper ad, uh, TV repair shop, just wanted help with somebody, you know, to paint the showroom and help deliver TVs and you know do things like that. And so I went and did that, you know, went there, took that job, and. You know, shortly, you know, after starting the job, I kind of worked my way back to where the techs were on the bench and uh, was started to do, you know, this is going back to the days before the electronic tuners. You know, you actually had mm. a knob you turned. <laughs> yeah. And one of the one of the things that you had to do to maintain these TVs when people brought them in was you'd tear the tur- tuners apart and you'd go in with a buffing tool and buff all the contacts in <laughs> the rotary tuners. And, uh, and, that, and that, was, that was where I started on the bench was buffing contacts on TV tuners. So- so, so and, it's a uh, genuine tune-up, <laughs> right? It's like putting your car in for a yeah. tune-up, you know? You, <laughs> sprayed, you sprayed them down, but instead of carburetor cleaner, it was tuner cleaner, you know, yeah. it was t- contact cleaner. And you go in there and you go in with a small little screwdriver and bend the contacts up that would have kind of worn down a little bit to get yeah. a little bit you know, tighter contact. You'd, you'd buff wow. all the contacts to get the oxidation off them and then have to put the tuners back together, throw them back in the set. You know, so And that, that just led to getting more and more involved on the bench. I didn't do any real full-time servicing there. I kind of just did some of the kind of more mundane and routine things. Because this, go- this is right about the mm. time when the, the TVs that were coming across the counter to be serviced, about half of them were still vacuum tube based. And the other half right. were, you know, kind of starting to be more and more solid state. And it's before, you know, there was a lot of, you know, larger scale integration with solid state stuff. So a lot of it was just discrete transistorized, you know, type circuitry with mm-hmm. a couple of ICs. So it was a, it was a real yeah, good time. Yeah, they actually I, I had learned... uh, service back then too, right? Yes. They actually yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. brought them back in That's right. versus these days where it's like, well, it's throw it away. Yeah. People throw it away. Yeah. So yeah. It was, I learned so much in that job and, and learned so much about the value of being able to properly interpret what's going on 
on, be able to properly use mm -hmm. tools, whether it's a scope or a multimeter or whatever it might be. And uh, so it was it was really a, what a great learning experience. And then between that and, you know, the, the electronics, you know, work at school and then the electronics teacher at school is also a ham radio operator. So he kind of organized a ham radio club. So I kind of got involved with that. And that just kind of set the path, you know, for me at that point. So it was it was really, really, really cool thing. So I, oh, yeah, you were done for. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was done. So I worked there through high school. And then uh, I think even maybe summers uh, between college semesters before I took my next engineering job, you know, engineering kind of trainee job, you know, while I was in college. But uh, but that was that was a lot of fun. I really I learned a lot from that job. And the amateur radio side of things is still being taught to kids at um, at uh, scouts and stuff like that, which we were talking about before the show. Sure. Isn't it? You've got, uh, what is it, this weekend, is it? Yeah, this weekend actually is, and it's a worldwide thing called Jamboree on the Air. And that's kind of where scouts all around the world will Jota. get on the air. Joda, absolutely. Yep. Uh, so that's kind of a worldwide thing. There'll be scouts all over the world will get uh, uh, on the air and uh, hopefully make connections with other scouts and things like that. So I'm involved with a couple of different troops uh, locally uh, that we're going to be getting getting them on the air. And uh, also there's another uh, one of the troops uh, that's fairly close by here we're kind of tithing, tying this all in to doing a, a radio merit badge at the same time so i'm going to nice. do the instruction for the radio merit badge to the kids and get them down to uh down to what one of my radio clubs radio stations get them on the air and talking with either other scouts or other hams you know as part of this mm -hmm. uh, radio merit badge and tell us about the location you're using Oh yeah, this uh, one of the this is cool. This yeah. is cool, folks. Yeah, this is uh, mm -hmm. one of the radio clubs I belong to. Um, they're very, very lucky to have a location that used to be part of Camp Evans, uh, part of Fort Monmouth in New Jersey. Now, this location is kind of a, a large site. That part of it, uh, particularly the part that was um, part of like the uh, Signal Corps you know, for the U.S. Army and things like that. A lot of the radar work was done there uh, during World War II. In fact, Howard Volum, who started Tektronics, worked on this site doing radar before he started Tektronics. There you go. So, so also the same site, uh, it was a Marconi wireless location. In fact, it was the home of the Marconi wireless company in New Jersey. Um, and um, just down the road from this, from where the Marconi stuff was, is a, a site that uh, is called, we call it the Diana site, because it's where Project Diana was run in the 1940s. A Project Diana is was the project that the uh, the Army Signal Corps ran that was the first uh, time that they basically bounced a radio wave off the moon and uh, and if you think about that well yep. you know well okay what what kind of implications does that have well it kind of proved everything because, <laughs> everything because it kind of really proved that you could get radio signals beyond our atmosphere and get them back so that kind of paved the way for you know satellites for man mm -hmm. man space flight you know all these kinds of you know technologies were kind of enabled by proving that you could actually get radio waves through the atmosphere and back mm. and that so where the our radio club has their site is actually right in the same spot. In fact, you know the mounts from where that that uh, that radar tower was, where they did uh, Project Diana, mm -hmm. was right outside the door of where our radio club meets. So, um, but now, would I'm curious about the technical details of this? Would it just be like a ping, or would they actually be able to send like speech and? sort of bounce that back oh, this off is, the moon. Yeah, well, would it would you be able to do that? Well this is this is going back to, you know, the forties and it was just yeah. it was really just a radar uh, just a ping. because uh, you got about you know like a two and a half second delay. Okay, yep. from bouncing a signal off the moon and back, but it was literally just a ping. I mean it was basically using mm. using a radar signal basically. Yeah, oh, right. So, and yep. There's a little blip on the radar screen. Yep, yep. we got it back. Yeah, and there, you know. there are folks now, especially in the ham radio world, that do what we call EME, which is Earth, Moon, Earth. And they've got, mm -hmm. they set up big arrays and operate in VHF and UHF frequency ranges and literally bounce signals off the moon now. But this was the first time that it was done because nobody knew if it could be done. Mm. It was sweet. One of the stories that I heard is actually kind of interesting really cool. is that um, when they ran this uh, thing, it was actually a Dr. Robert McAfee was one of the, the key founders or key, key guys that were working on this. And when they when they did this thing, McAfee actually calculated the distance between the Earth and the moon. And the funny mm. thing is, is that nobody ever went back to question those calculations until literally probably 20 or 30 years ago. Okay, you know, like in the nineteen seventies, and that 1970s. would have been with the uh, laser reflectors that they put on. Oh, and all kinds moon, of other right? type of things. And what, what they found out is that 
McAfee's initial calculations from back in the 40s were only off by about eight inches. Oh, wow. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. <laughs> With the technology at the time from, you know, from the 40s when they did this thing, that it was within a foot. <laughs> hasn't, hasn't the moon, like, like uh, gotten closer or further away yeah, think, in, like by, by eight inches in that time? I think it goes like an inch a year or something. Yeah, it, it does move. I think what they did is they calculated back to what the distance would have been then. Oh, would have been. Yeah. And it was only out by... Right. Wow. Pretty amazing. That's impressive. Yep. And he did that using radar. Yes, exactly. So Wow. So it's pretty, pretty amazing Jeez. stuff. So this, so this is the site that has all this history. You know, this is just kind of a touching on a little bit of it as some mm. of this history. And what's what's also really cool too is that when I was in college, uh, I worked on that same site, not on the Nana site, but on the other site where it was, you know, Fort Monmouth, the Signal Corps, where the Marconi Marconi company was. I worked on mm-hmm. that site for a couple of summers for the U.S. Army Signal Corps. Well, actually, it wasn't the Signal Corps then, but it was part of the U.S. Army uh, doing some communications research. So that was one of my summer jobs. So it was really cool to, you know, to kind of be back there now as part of, a, you know, a club that has a presence on the site. Excellent. So yeah. what are you doing at... Um... Tektronix. Well, Tektronix. At the moment. Well, uh, I've been working for Tektronix for a little over six years. I'm a field application engineer. So what that means is that, uh, you know, I'm the guy out in, the, out in you know, kind of distributed out in the country. There's a couple of us out here. I kind of cover the northeastern part of the U.S. And my job is mm-hmm. basically to support customers um, that are using Tektronix equipment. Uh, I kind of specialize more on the RF end of things, you know, real-time spectrum analyzers and right. vector signal analysis and RF signal mm-hmm. generation, high-speed scopes, and those kinds of things. But anywhere within, you know, basically all of the New England states, all of New York, all of New Jersey, eastern Pennsylvania, right. and northern Maryland. So you go out and show them how That's to tweak a lot the of knobs, driving. Huh? <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's it, it's a mix of both what we call pre-sales and post-sales work. Uh, the pre-sales right. work is the, the local account managers will bring me in, and I'll do you know technical presentations or seminars. We mm-hmm. we run a number of things called lunch and learns, where we'll bring equipment in and bring in pizza, and I may give a talk on you know advanced <laughs> yeah. radar characterization or satellite communications analysis or something like that while we you know right. have pizza and talk about that kind of thing. And then uh, so that's you know kind of half well, one half of the job. The other half is you know post sales technical support. If a guy's doing some programming on, you know, and how, how do I program this instrument to do this using, you know, Mat- mm-hmm. MATLAB or something like that, or if you've got a question about how to do something, um, you know, then I'm kind of the local technical resource that, uh, you know, can go help them out. Got it. Yeah. Well, we've, we've jumped from your first job in the TV repair place to your current job. What happened in between? Well... Um, well, like I said I went. I got my degree um, from uh, NJIT, Jersey Institute of Technology, in '85. And while I was going to school, I did work for the U.S. Army, uh, doing some communications research. It was actually kind of interesting. I was doing research on uh, bouncing radio waves off of the ionized trails left by meteoric particles as they hit the atmosphere and burn up. So, right. so, so pretty cool stuff. Called <laughs> and why were they interested in that? Well, Probably for the ICBMs or something. No, right? actually, it's interesting. It's, no? it's, it's really it, it's what it does is it gives you a very short, short duration uh, antenna, so to speak, or a little reflector, mm-hmm. uh, so that basically if you illuminate the atmosphere with RF. Okay, and some of these these meteors or these little particles hit the atmosphere and create a little trail of ions. That trail mm-hmm. of ions will either reflect or re-radiate the signal back to Earth. But because it's such a long, thin line, it only illuminates a very small patch of space on the Earth. Okay, so you could have you know a thousand receivers or transmitters or radio state radio sites out you know distributed all over the place and the chances of lighting up any more than one of those at any time from a, one of these rate these meteor trails is very slim so you get kind mm-hmm. of natural time division multiplexing okay oh, so wait. it's good for remote data collection because the transmissions are very short a few hundred milliseconds or less so it's really kind of a mm-hmm. very low power very hard to detect type of transmission technology because the apparent direction that the radio signal takes is not straight in line with the transmitter because the the trails come mm-hmm. and when they hit the atmosphere come kind of come in at an angle so the 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 radio signal actually kind of goes a bit off axis it gets re- reflected back so from a security right. standpoint it's very tough to direction find okay? okay so a lot of interesting technologies you know a lot of interesting reasons why they wanted to get in, get involved with that so i did some research uh for that 
uh, for that technology while I was in college. Then they all... Is that similar to what they're doing with harp these days? Well, uh, frequency hopping, you, you, people do like frequency hopping and frequency agile technologies today, a lot of for the same reasons to make it hard to intercept, okay, and hard to jam, okay, because it's not always right. coming from the same place, you know, in the, in the frequency domain, but they're still coming from the same place physically. So there isn't a way of really being able to kind of get Got around it. that. So, <clears throat> but and if uh, our listeners don't know about harp, it's the what is it? High harp. energy. Oh, I'm sorry. You said harp. I thought I was okay. Okay, the, the accent got me. I was thinking hop, H O P, like frequency hopping. Oh no no no! Oh, harp. You're thinking the harp, uh, that... the one that the conspiracy oh, theorists yeah, yeah. love. Well, yeah, the... Because if you don't know about that, <laughs> listeners, it's a huge, um, uh, like probably the world's most powerful. Yes transmitter or something yeah. that did, i don't where's it located it's up in alaska, alaska or something? i think but I, I don't know that yep. much about it other than it's a high altitude radiation project or something like that but uh, project and all the conspiracy yeah. theorists you know like to think that it's oh it's a doomsday weapon and it can alter the world's weather and all okay. that sort of yeah crap, i don't you know? actually and the truth i don't know that much about what they're doing with harp so it's uh, so uh, right. <laughs> I, okay. kinda, I went cool. down the wrong path right there so <laughs> okay no but, worries um, ah. so so, uh, please oh, continue. Sure. What after okay, that? Okay, after that, well, I got my degree. And this is one of these things where, you know, you, senior in college, you interview with all these different places. And uh, uh, one of the places I interviewed was a startup company. It was a little startup called Lytel, uh, based in Jersey. And uh, Lytel basically was started by a couple of guys from, uh, from Bell Labs and RCA and things like that. And they, they were basically developing what we called then long wavelength optical semiconductors. So uh, 1300 nanometer uh, LEDs, photodiodes, and Fabry Pro mm-hmm. laser diodes. Okay. So, so right. I, joined that, I joined them. And uh, so they, the company kind of had two halves. So one half was the device fab side of the house, and the other half was kind of the, you know, Kind of module side of the house, the module side of the house. So they had their own gear to actually fab yes. their own semiconductor. Yes. Yeah, so they, right. they fab okay. the laser diodes, the LEDs, and the, and the PIN photodiodes. I worked for the side of the house that took those devices and made optical transceivers out of them. So I did, you know, the the trans optical transmitter and receiver designs for the for applications. Mm-hmm. And most of these applications were kind of geared towards multi-mode uh, data communication, optical networking, things like uh, like FDDI, yep. fiber distributed data interface. And mm-hmm. uh, so we did a lot of products for there. And then also some of the uh, uh, kind of ATM type things, 100, you know, 100, uh, 100, 155, yes, 622, et cetera, yep. some fiber channel right. work, and then some, some single mode optical uh, stuff with the, with the laser diodes and things like that. So I did a lot of those designs mm-hmm. and they initially started off being kind of discrete based designs where we were, you know, using like dual gate MOSFETs for the, the transipedance mm-hmm. amplifiers. We were actually using, uh, believe it or not, on the receiver side of things, we actually used some, uh, uh, Motorola uh, 10116 triple ECL line receivers as as oh, yeah. fiber optic post amps because they were really nice low oh. power emitter coupled pair you know amplifiers mm-hmm. and they were three in a package and if you kind of cascaded those you had a pretty nice well behaving differential emitter coupled pair differential amplifier mm-hmm. a, a limiting amp so that was kind of our those suckers we we used for yeah, everything yep, like they that really were, they? they really were they really were. Are they still well, are? Well, they were then. I don't know if they still are now, but they certainly were. Right. And we actually use them in okay. dye form. You know, we we're actually doing hybrids, so we actually right. buying them in dye and putting them mm. down. And then, uh, and then the transmitters were started off being, you know, kind of discrete based, and then eventually, about four years in, uh, we started doing some semi-custom analog ICs for those solutions. Okay. So we did, you know, an integrated preamp. We did a a post amp, which actually, you know, we did a, a kind of a unique post amp that I actually got a patent on, which was kind of cool. And then, uh, then an in- integrated uh, transmitter that had uh, t- uh, temperature compensation for the LEDs and things like that to give a, nice, a reasonably flat optical power versus temperature and that kind of thing. So, right. um, so that was kind of fun. And did did they eventually get bought out by AMP? What's the story there? Because they're now AMP license. Exactly, exactly there. right. In fact, um, yeah. So I, I worked for them. Uh, they, we AMP was always a big customer. Okay, and uh, and so ah. we, basically all of AMP's you know fiber optic products at that time, the active fiber optic products were were Lytels. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we we made them for, under our own name Got and it. also did them for AMP. Eventually, AMP bought us out, and we became a um, a wholly owned subsidiary. 
And that lasted, I don't know, a mm-hmm. year and a half or so, or two years. And then we essentially got absolved in and became essentially a division. And at that uh-huh. point, you know, I went from employee yep. number 58 to 31,622. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Congratulations. So, then, so I continued to work for AMP. We continued to make those products. And I was doing, you know, I was responsible. At, at basically got to the point where I was, you know, doing a lot of the design work and responsible for teams that were doing some of the design work and all the application support and test development and things like that. And then uh, around about 1999, AMP got bought by Tyco. Okay. Ah, yes, and that's, they did. And that's when I, yes. I basically I think I got one paycheck from Tyco, and that's when I was I was I was leaving. <laughs> but I was it was to the point where I was kind of redesigning the same products for the third time or fourth time to take the last dime out of it. Got it. And it yeah. just wasn't that much fun anymore. And I uh, and I left and went to another startup. <laughs> so <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Who is um, who, who's yes. this Multilink? Yeah, so Multilink Technology Corporation, interesting company. Um, and it was uh, it was funny because when I started at, at AMP or at Lytel, I was employee number fifty eight. When I started at Multilink, I was number fifty nine. Uh, yeah, it's just just I don't, right. know, I don't know how it worked out that way, but it did. So um, so at the time when I was hired, Multilink was still based in California in um, San Jose. Um, mm-hmm. uh, let's see, it wasn't San Jose. Shoot, San, San Diego. Right. Was, oh, anyway, we were based in California, Santa Monica. That's where it was. Santa Monica. I knew it was out there. <laughs> Somewhere in California. It's only a small so, state. Yeah. So for was... the first uh, two weeks, I spent out in Santa Monica. Um, but they were the, the president of the company right. was mo- gonna, planning on moving the headquarters to New Jersey anyway. So the so first two weeks I mm-hmm. spent in Santa Monica. The next three or four weeks I spent working out of my house, and then when we found a location in New Jersey, I started working in the New Jersey facility, and. Uh, why did they want to move to well, Jersey? Was, uh, Multilink was making components primarily for high-speed telecommunication optical networking, 10 and 12 and a half gigabit per second type mm-hmm. stuff. And a lot of the optical networking work that was being done was based on the East Coast, okay? And many companies in the oh, East okay. Coast, uh, people like, you know, Sienna, Cisco, you know, Sycamore Networks, things like that, as well mm-hmm. as in Europe. So, uh, so the kind of, and then right. we also had a big design center and a presence in Germany. So it really, it, and and also the founder of the company was originally from New Jersey too. So I think all of those things conspired to getting us, you know, a little bit closer to where the customers were, and also closer in terms of time zone to where a lot of our work was being done. And it was also a right, fair amount of talent it. in New Jersey from you know things like Bell Labs and, and places like that to draw from, you know, in the high speed optical networking space. So uh, right, yeah. Makes so sense. So that, that was a real interesting job. I was I was kind of brought on in, on in an application engineering role, primarily to help uh, build um, the application development boards that would be used with these products. These were things like, you know, twelve and a half gig you know, clock and data recovery, uh, you know, mod uh, circuits and uh, electrical muxes and demuxes, clock multipliers, optical mm-hmm. modulator drivers, and things like that. And these were basically modules and ICs. So, uh, so, so my group developed the application right. boards that we'd mount these things to to send to customers so they can go play with them, you know, to see whether they like them and that kind of thing. So, yeah. Got it. Now, I'm going to okay. grill you here. Like this is like a job <laughs> interview here. We're going through your chronological okay. <laughs> work history there. I note that on LinkedIn, yeah. there, there's a year missing here after Multilink. Yes. There's yes, a year there missing. Okay. Do tell. Well, what did you do? Did you go to India and <laughs> no, find no, yourself? No. Well, it's funny because <laughs> I, I guess I just never filled in the year, the missing link. What happened was is that Multilink. Uh, this is the startup that where we we kind of rode that telecom bubble. I mean, money was money was falling right. out of yeah. trees. You know, yeah, we, right. oh that man, it was. Horse, I know? mean, it was just a fantastic <laughs> time to be an engineer, and it you know, just it was just you know. I remember one one time somebody said that oh it's like being an engineer. You know, in these days is like being a rock star. And I remember someone saying, "Yeah, yeah, but without the women." But uh, so, but but it was just just an amazing time. And then, of course, we rode that telecom bubble. And then, um, when the bubble started to mm-hmm. burst, okay, and things started going downhill, okay, and then everybody exercised their options, and things were going really just flying the wrong direction. There was yeah, a run yeah, on exactly. the bank, so, folks. Well, the Multilink eventually got bought out, okay, and got bought by uh, Vitesse right. Semiconductor. 
Okay. So oh, I worked okay. for Vitesse because uh, when they bought us out, I just, you know, I basically kept my job, you know, working in New Jersey. They wanted to move me to California, but I, I didn't want to go to California. So I kept I kept a job in, in New Jersey and I worked for Vitesse for, it was probably about a year and a half or so until Vitesse shut down the facility in New Jersey. So I think that might be the only thing on LinkedIn that I that I didn't put in there uh, was Vitesse. So that's probably the missing link. Uh, so that they they they're still Vitesse going, is, aren't they? And they are. And uh, yeah, yeah, I thought so. I haven't used their parts for many yeah, years. Yeah, it's now, funny because I think some think of the products that I that I was responsible for supporting and things like that, I think are still current products that that they're selling there now. So, but um, so okay. that was, that was the missing thing there in LinkedIn, probably. Um, and then ah, when they shut right. down the facility in New Jersey, then I was you know for the first time in fifteen years looking for a job. Um, but, uh, so I, I didn't, I didn't look for real long. I wound up uh, going out to a gear systems out in Allentown, uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania. So a gear mm-hmm. is, um, what used to be, you know, Bell Labs, Western Electric, you know, et cetera. Okay. Uh, okay. So, that, oh, right. so okay. After exactly. 10 name so, changes, so it right. was a gear when I was there. Okay. And, uh, you know, basically the, you know, the, the, the original fabs where they fab the, the first ICs and things like that was all done out there. And I was brought in there to uh, put together a a validation team for read channel ICs for hard disk drives. So read channels hmm. sound like a fairly simple device. Um, read channels are the the device that sits just just behind the preamp, that's just behind the head inside of a disk drive. Okay. Right. And please okay. explain what it does for those who don't know their hard drive. Yeah, so a hard disk drive is a magnetic storage media, all right? And there's a, so there's a head that is kind of like storing things on tape, except it's a circular magnetic disk, okay? And then the head would, is responsible for reading the magnetic impulses that are on the disk or, or, or writing them to it, okay? So the preamp doubles as a write amplifier as well as a preamp to read and write. Those very small signals that come off when we're reading would go into what's called the read channel, mm-hmm. Okay, and the read channel was responsible for basically pulling that data back out and turning it back into the ones and zeros. But what's interesting is that what people don't think right. about, there was actually three jobs. There was reading data, there was writing data, but there's also a very a, a third very important one that nobody knows about or talks about. It's called servo. And so if you think of, if you looked if you could see the magnetic information on the platter of the disk, uh, you and if you could see what's going on magnetically, you'd actually see that there's wedges kind of like wedges, like slices of pizza or slices of pie, okay? And those right. wedges had what we call servo tracks or servo information. So as the disk is mm-hmm. spinning and the, the, the head is reading, it would be reading data, and then it would read servo information. So the servo information would, would go into a feedback loop that would do a fine position of the head back and forth to keep it on track. Oh, okay. And then it would okay. go back to read, servo, right. read, servo, read, servo. And then maybe, I don't know, I've, it's been a while now. I can't remember how many, if there were a dozen you yep. know, wedges or more or less or whatever it was around the, the disk. I don't really remember that anymore. But um, Is this so that they can get the higher density that yeah. they do these days? Did they come to a point where we need this oh, yeah. servo stuff to micro-position we're literally head. talking that... about moving you know, right. in ten, nanometers. Yeah. <laughs> well, not nanometers, but I mean... It's microns worth right. half a bee's dick yeah, there you in go. technical okay. terms. So, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so you just couldn't position the head, just saying move it to this step on a stepper motor anymore. Okay, so right. So that it's, was one okay. one reason. Well, that was certainly you know to get the track density, you had to kind of really be able to servo that, mm-hmm. and then also you know for vibration mm-hmm. and things like that because you couldn't hold position. But then the other thing too is that the coding that is used. Um, uh, encoding, I should mm-hmm. say, that is used. You know, you wind up at these signals. If you think about like a high-speed serial data transmission, okay, it's kind of the same type of thing. You got just ones and zeros. You have two states, but there's there's the yeah. coding, encoding now allows you to have much much higher, um, I guess, bit densities. Okay, therefore read and write speeds. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so therefore more bits because you can actually with the coding you can now have. You know, inter symbol interference across five or six symbols. And and the wow. predictive coding that is used is partial response, maximal likelihood mm-hmm. type of thing. All that encoding that is used allows you to kind of separate out and, and pull the data out of this very, very highly, you know, inter interfere type of signal. <laughs> so uh <laughs> These hard drives are just they black really are. magic, really. People talk about RF it's, being black magic. No, look into hard drive modern hard drive design. It folks. really is amazing. It really is it's amazing. Crazy. So. It's incredible. It's a wonder we get the things as reliable as they are. You know, it's funny because I remember even after 
working on you know developing validation plans for these read channels i remember thinking that myself like how does this mm. thing even work you know because, because that's you know yeah, because no, know. literally <laughs> you know this would be a small chip or a small piece of ip that would go on a larger soc like a system on chip mm-hmm. and literally the data book or the i should say you know the data sheet if you printed out the data sheet would be the size of a small phone book because of all the registers mm-hmm. and things like that. I mean, literally, right. there'll be you know sometimes yep. a half a dozen interconnecting analog and digital feedback loops oh, between oh. clock recovery loops and automatic gain control uh-huh. and, and digital feedback mm-hmm. taps for different types of equalization and all the predictive oh, coding. Man. So, yeah, I mean, just amazing, complex and stuff. Here it is. People think that hard drives are just like a stepper motor. It moves the head to the position and writes yeah. a one or a zero. It it hasn't been that way probably. for what I don't probably, know, 15, yeah, 20 at least, years, at least probably that long. You know, and uh, yeah, yeah, they they don't actually use stepper motors anymore. They use cert- like a like a DC, a linear yeah, DC motor. Yeah, right? I mean, the, the motor they control a- was a whole another separate piece that was outside of the rechannel. All we were doing is we mm. were giving it information, <laughs> so right. they could do whatever they want with it. <laughs> you know, and, and as you can imagine, in trying to develop the the validation plans for these things, you know, we, I didn't get much past uh-huh. you know, the blinders of what the rechannel was. You know, <laughs> to to really you know, because <laughs> right. uh, it was just so much to know from that standpoint. You couldn't even understand that, let alone the other yeah, aspects. Because of the, the problem system, is right? validating these things yeah. is, a, is a, a you know a very complex job. Because you know traditionally what would happen is you get a, de- a device would come back and uh, you know you'd have each engineer would go in and check his little part, but you really had to check the whole thing that it works together when you configure it certain uh-huh. ways. And and that was largely done by application engineers, you know, way back in the day. You know, I was going to say, yeah, who is who is the engineer responsible for ensuring that all of those half a dozen feedback systems all work yeah. together and do what you want. I mean, that really be the hardest was. job and of all. The thing is, the it? application engineers that were there were phenomenal, and they were working all with the various customers and mm. things like that, and uh, you know, making sure that they worked in the configuration that this customer was going to use it, and this, you know, this one was going to use it here, mm-hmm. and um, and they really knew the parts very well. I relied an awful lot on them to learn as much as I needed to learn to help put together more formal mm-hmm. validation plans uh, beyond what they were doing kind of in the past. And uh, so it was, that was a fun Got job, it. but especially at the beginning, because I was learning an awful lot. I was in the lab pushing buttons and twiddling knobs a lot and that kind of a thing. And once we kind of put the team together and uh, and started, you know, had our methodology kind of going, you know, I was spending more and more mm-hmm. time, you know, in meetings and pushing Gantt charts and things like that. And, uh-huh. you know, we were, and the, the team was doing a great job and our customers were very happy with what we were doing. My the management team was very happy with what we were doing, but I was not having much fun anymore. And, uh, because you weren't doing what lab. hands on. I was, I, I never got off the carpet. You yeah. Know? You were, you were right. tweaking I, I those wasn't scope getting off the carpet and pushing buttons and twiddling yep. knobs. And, uh, and the people that worked for me kind of understood that, but the people that I worked for didn't. And, uh, so when ah. I, and I, so I, I've got, you know, some friends that, uh, that work at Tektronix and I had one in particular that I've known for a long time cause he was kind of always my manager. And he told me about this position as an application engineer that was opening up and, uh, you know, and, and that's a, Big change, going from working in companies with labs and people and things like that to being a road warrior, you know, being out on the mm-hmm. road. And uh, and you were a high end. I was. You were a fail. You know, like a, you were actually. Well, yeah, you had, had people had under you. You're a manager, manager at one right? point. Uh, probably this team. I think I had twelve or fifteen people working for me in in three three or four locations uh-huh. across the U.S. And um, but uh, I just I wasn't having fun. So I heard about this job, and I remember you know when I was thinking about taking it, it's like, you know, I would be on the road, you know, but I'd be doing stuff that I really enjoy doing. I mean, I enjoy mm-hmm. teaching, I enjoy te- yep. uh, teaching people and explaining through things and helping to, to explain technical topics and learning about things, something different every day. So when I told people I was leaving you know, to take this job with Tektronix, everybody mm-hmm. who worked for me was like, oh man, you got to take that job. That's you, you know, but everybody yeah, who right. worked about, you know, who I worked for were like, where are you going? I mean, uh-huh. you're, people love what you're doing here. Why would you want what? to leave? You know, so right, right. You're a manager. What? Nobody right, ever right. steps I, down. I, so I, you know, I for me, management. I mean, I could do it, but I just don't enjoy it. You know, and uh, so, but and right. this role now, I mean, I, I absolutely love this job. You know, it's uh, you know, I, I yes, this it's, it's Tektronix, and that, that was in 2006. About. It was yeah. when I left. Uh, yeah. I left a gear and came to Tektronix, and. Uh, I just have this is this is like the mm-hmm. best job I ever had. I, I don't know that I could ever go back to a, a real job again, 
Yeah, because I, I, I don't, I don't call this a real job <laughs> because, uh, you know, it's I, it, the real job is that, you know, the deadlines, the schedules, the this, the that, the office, the commute. Uh, you yeah. know, me, my yeah. commute can range anywhere from, mm-hmm. you know, walking 30 feet in my house to, you know, a 500 mile drive, mm-hmm. you know, because it's, it's something it's something different every right. day and every week. Uh, but it's also something different every day or every week that I'm working on. You know, I could be I could be helping somebody, you know, debug mm-hmm. a, uh, you know, a, a very sophisticated you know, radar jamming system one day, and then the next day helping somebody mm-hmm. uh, understand where this electromagnetic interference is coming from. Um, maybe the next day talking about right. you know, RFID or near field communications with somebody, or or helping somebody debug a mm-hmm. uh, you know an SPI bus or I squared C bus or something the next day. So it's uh, you know something different every day. And uh, real electronics it, 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 engineering. As opposed to just uh, yeah, playing with yeah, fiddle and, and, and Gantt charts, right? And, and I'm doing, not, I'm doing not, stuff. Like I said, I'm not doing much design work, right? I mean, I'll do some programming and things like that. Oh no, but, uh, no, but I'm but helping to solve problems. And yep. the, the great thing about being an application engineer is that, mm-hmm. for the most part, there aren't that many looming deadlines. And to me, the things that were always very stressful yes. in any job was yeah. the looming deadlines. Oh, I got to get this done. This is to do by this. I got to get that done. Well, yeah. that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, people think, you know, they want to get into electronics engineering and they think design is mm-hmm. the duck's guts. But when you get down to it, you spend half your time <laughs> dicking around trying to, you know, in meetings trying to – and or, you know, updating your right. Gantt chart, trying to get stuff done yep. as a design engineer. And you've got to meet those ridiculous deadlines sometimes yeah. and it can be a pain in the ass. So I can uh, – like I, I haven't been an applications engineer but i can imagine you go in you help someone do something really cool solve a problem exactly. and then bang you walk away you, you wipe your hands off it and you exactly go on right. to the next cool and, thing uh, and the thing is you know, there so may be some follow-up yeah. you know I, oh i got I'll, I'll help you develop this code or i'll oh, go look course. into that problem but uh, that's the kind of thing that but like you said it, it's a bunch of small victories as opposed to one long battle you know and, uh-huh. uh, and yes well, I've worked on many a project where I've worked for a couple of years on a project and it goes nowhere. Yep. Right, so right, there is no right. victory after a couple yep. of years. So, right? uh, <laughs> so pure design engineering is right. not all and it's cracked up is, to you've be, gotta, folks. You've got to enjoy the travel, you know, or at least not be bothered too much by the travel. You've got to right. be in a, in a position where you're, you, you enjoy working with people and helping to convey topics, sometimes technical topics, to not so many, not, not so many technical people. Because mm-hmm. one of the things that you learn is that when, when I go in to visit a customer, you know, most of the time I know a lot more about the equipment that they're using than, than they do, but they know an awful lot more about their application than yep. I do. So, so there's opportunity to learn of in both course. directions. So I've <laughs> got to hear what they're working on and particularly what their pain is, what kind of problems they're trying to solve. And then I try to, you know, I look to say what's the best way we right. can help solve that pain with the solutions we can bring to the table. Mm-hmm. And interestingly, that's actually, uh, you know, that's how, that's how you make money anytime, right? I mean, that's how you, <laughs> if, you if you're doing a startup, right? It's like you're, how, how do you reduce pain for people? And then they'll right. pay for it. You know, obviously they pay, they pay more for, you know, maybe tech scopes than they would like a Chinese knockoff, but they also get people like you that will come and fix their pain. <laughs> or, yeah, or certainly help them through it and that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, so it's, yeah. it's just a great, you know, for me, it's a great fit. I mean, I, I absolutely love the job. And uh, like I said, I, I don't think I could ever go back to a real job again. So <laughs> what's, what's the craziest problem you've ever dealt with? I mean... Well, I, as you can imagine, a lot of the problems that I deal with with customers, I can't talk about. Um, yeah. So, and uh, n- not only because a <laughs> yeah. lot of what I'll do, I do sometimes is, you know, based on, you know, military government type work, but also, you know, oh, I don't want yeah. to embarrass any particular customer, <laughs> you know, either. Oh, you know, I don't want names. Oh, these guys, you know. So, <laughs> oh, right. you can give us something but, generic, uh, can't you? <laughs> yeah, usually, usually the trickier problems are things like uh, EMI issues. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. Because uh, uh, a lot of the oh, times, yeah. you know, people will be dealing with. The, okay, they develop this product, and and many customers don't have their own, you know, uh, EMI compliance labs, right? So they go spend money, they send this thing off to a compliance lab, go get it tested. Okay, and then you know, th- th- if it, uh, they might go test it. They test it five times, and it fails once out of five times. What do you do? Right, guys will bring it back, and they throw a little bit more aluminum foil over here, a little shielding over there. Send it back out, cross their fingers, hope that it fixed <laughs> yeah. it, that type of thing, you know. Yeah. And and these are the kinds of things that can be really tricky because a lot of times the you know, these transient emissions that you get out of a product are not from one particular source. A lot of times it's it's a mixing product or an intermod product of of many things conspiring together. 
Oh, okay. Man. And uh, yes, you've got two exactly. buses that yep. are doing, you know, that are doing something. It's only converging together once in, in a blue moon. Exactly. And that's when you, you have, get you that have issue. Clock, and, you know, different you know. clock domains yeah. that could Oof. things line up exactly wrong. Uh-huh. You got a yeah. synthesizer <laughs> over here; it's doing something, and maybe an analog processor over here; it's doing something, and they start interacting. These are the kind of things that are really, really tricky to solve. And uh, you know, and then you know, by being able to kind of mm-hmm. ultimately grab things in as many domains as possible. Okay, you look at things in the frequency mm-hmm. domain, in the time domain, in <laughs> modulation domain. And, and be able to capture these things all simultaneously yeah. and look at them. Then you can try to figure out, oh, this is when that's occurring, and now, and now you go solve that problem. But so there's been mm-hmm. a several instances of things like that that I've been involved with that have been a real challenge until you kind of peel back the onion enough right. to find that smoking gun. So <laughs> sometimes you can't find yeah. the smoking gun, though. Sometimes you because of time pressures you cannot do it but 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 you know if you put that little alfoil or your finger oh, yeah. there it fixes the problem so you work around it sometimes you just have to admit yeah, defeat i cannot solve this is... but 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 right. i know and, how and to do the clutch is, to fix is it. using more of your senses yeah. i mean you want to use the, the best equipment you can get to look at things a certain uh-huh. way but also don't be afraid to use your you know use a sense of sight smell touch okay mm-hmm. you know like you said you, you kind of mm-hmm. put your finger on it the, the hairs on yeah. the back of your neck yeah. stand up. Oh, it's got to be that. Yeah. I can feel and, and, it in my bones. There's some, you know? there's, yeah, there's, yeah. there's some validity to all of that. I mean, putting your yeah. finger on components and if things behave differently, if I touch here, I move here, that can give yeah. you some insight to what's going on. So, you don't, you, you, you know, getting touchy-feely mm-hmm. with what you're doing can, can You're not can a really desperate engineer a until, time, you, so. until you suggest that you cut someone's finger off and tape it inside of every product. <laughs> well, well, I'll tell you an interesting <laughs> story. There's, there's an interesting oh, story God. about that. <laughs> Whoa, nothing illegal here, Alan. We don't want to know no, about any... No, no, no. Uh, no. no this, is, this is going back. This is a story <laughs> I'm relating from a colleague that I worked with uh, at gotcha. my first job. And and he was telling me about a, a similar problem where they were working on this module. And when they sealed the module up in its housing, they were getting some kinds of I don't know, it was oscillations or some spurious results or something like that. Something was working wacky when they sealed this thing up. But if they opened it up, everything was fine. And they found it's, uh, if they actually took some like the, the black conductive foam, okay, that uh, – um, <laughs> you know, with and like chips and stuff. It, Right, yeah, yeah. And, and kind of stuck it inside and sandwiched it inside the assembly when they closed it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they, and, they, and they had to kind of make it shaped like little fingers to kind of fit into some cavities and stuff. And, uh, and we said, we kind of, he said that they kind of, kind of looked like a monkey's paw. Okay. <laughs> so actually, what they wound up doing for this first product until they, they shipped, the, until they fixed the problem was actually put, cut out a bunch of these pieces out of the foam and stuck them in there and sealed them up and shipped them. So they shipped products with these monkey's paws inside them because they solved this spurious <laughs> problem that was occurring. You know, so it didn't really fix the problem. It just kind of dampened the problem out so that they could ultimately fix it, but it bought them some time. So they actually, you know, they, they fixed it with a monkey's paw is what they called it. So. <laughs> Well, that may have, well, you're going to do that when you're when your conductive foam is like two k yeah. per square centimeter or something. You know, you you, you kind of alter and yeah, dampen and that, everything. Yeah, I don't know all the details, but that was kind so, of the, the story that nuts. we relayed, and it was I just thought it was kind oh, of man. funny. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's real engineering, folks. I mean, sometimes you've you know that that is embarrassing, right? That that yeah. you can't solve the problem, and you have to ship yeah. something like it's that. It's a money but issue. That's, You'd be surprised yeah, how often it, that Or sometimes kind of you thing find happens. something like that, and, and there is some kind of a bodge or you know, something you've got to do to make it work until you have time to spin the board over again or redo the hybrid or something like that you know, because of some issue. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, the, countless times, you know, the, first, the first products out the door have got these little you – know, we used to call them white wires, you know, little – and uh, right? Yeah, so, the uh, little bodge you know, wires. Something yeah. would be white wired or something would be this or you got you had to – you had to, you know, sky mount a component to kind of get it off the board to do things. And, you know, you did these ugly things to get parts out the door until you had time to, you know, you know this is back before you know, a lot of these quick turn board houses were around. So if you wanted to spin a board, it would be another couple of weeks before you could spin mm-hmm. the board. We're doing yeah. we're doing some yes. thick film hybrid stuff. That took some time to spin, you know, to do it over again. So, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, and if you're doing RF stuff, you need to, like, simulate everything as well, right? I mean, you got to 
Yeah. I guess back then there maybe weren't simulations, but... <laughs> yeah, a lot, again, a lot of what I did from the design work standpoint, a lot of it was, you know, this kind of high-speed electro-optical digital, digital, digital-ish digital type of stuff. It's fast enough that it wasn't really digital anymore. So I really don't, you know, don't call myself... I have called myself more of an analog engineer because it was really all analog problems that we solved, even Ooh. though the, the, the bits coming out, you know, the bits coming out yeah. of the data pins were, were digital, but that was, that was the only point it was, right? I mean, right. one of the examples is mm-hmm. I mean, one of the coolest parts I worked on um, was... Was a uh, a twelve and a half gigabit per second uh, clock and data recovery, up. and this was for fiber optic networks, and it literally was a you know, a mm-hmm. chip that would take the output of a like a transipedance amplifier, optical amplifier, you know, basically photodiode in into a transipedance amp, take that small signal out and regenerate, right. basically recover the clock, okay, resample the data, reconstruct the data, demux it out to like sixteen lines and out, but the amazing thing was this part would work at like 12 and a half gigabit per second and be able to recover data that was only a few millivolts peak to peak. Okay, at wow. 12 and a half gig. You know, and what what years was, is this? Because this this yeah. 12 and a half are like standard on FPGAs now, but I'm yeah, sure oh, whatever yeah. you're doing this, it was... This was back in like 2000, 2001. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's, that's killer, man. So 12 and a half, you know, so, so, so like, sing, like single digit millivolt sensitivity at 12 and a half gig, and not only to just to basically slice that and create the ones and zeros, but also to do the clock recovery on it. Okay. Yeah. And demux oh, it out to, you know, it's just amazing parts. So I, I didn't, I didn't do any of the design work on those chips, but I developed the uh, evaluation boards that those would go on because there was some, which is significant at those speeds, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah these were, we, the, the boards would use, you know, you know, especially for the high speed end of things, we had to use like Teflon materials, like Rogers materials as laminates yeah. in the board to minimize the loss. And we had, you know, these very precise Definitely. offset control loops that were kind of applied externally um, to, you know, uh, you know, to kind of set thresholds Shifted, appropriately yeah. and things like that. So, um, yeah. So, pretty cool stuff. That's really cool. Yeah. So, when you're tr- yeah. when when you're troubleshooting some of these problems, so you mentioned you mentioned troubleshooting EMI, and I'm sure you had to do that same kind of stuff back then. Mm-hmm. Um, do you actually use like antennas or wands or something to hold it over boards, or or is it actual direct probing? For it, well, it's, you know, like it, use... it's both, really. I mean, it's really both. I mean, you you would you, you go direct probing where you could, um, yeah, but a lot of times you wouldn't see things, especially if it's an EMI issue. The direct probing mm-hmm. may or may not give you insight to what's radiating. So typically, mm-hmm. if you, you'd actually, we'd often go in with either homemade or purchased uh, near field probes. Uh, called E field or H field probes, which are either like a loop or a stub type of antenna, and the and they're basically designed to respond to near field radiation. And you basically would just you know kind of wa- literally wand these things over the board, maybe with a spectrum analyzer or something like that to kind of see what's going on where. I mean, tools have gotten a lot better now where we can actually you know do that kind of a thing and then capture and record. RF over time, you know, in conjunction <laughs> with other signals to kind of see what's happening. But um, we didn't have those luxuries, you know, 15 years ago. But, um, you know, that uh, a lot of it, it would be doing that. Sometimes we'd just make our own little loop antennas to kind of fit into spaces that were needed and that kind of thing, you know, to, to find yeah. those kinds of problems. I've got to ask, so. what, what kind of scope do you have at home? Um, oh, you haven't my, seen his lab? His lab is own? crazy, man. <laughs> I know. Uh, uh, the scopes of my own? Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, well, yeah. Uh, well, we got an hour and a half left, right? Well, so we can probably go through all of them, right? Right now. Well, it's, it's it's scopes plural, okay? Yeah. Um, and and it's a yeah, being, being kind of in the industry, I mean, I guess the first scope that I bought was a a Tech 465B. I probably bought that about 20 years ago. Um, I still have that. But uh, since then, I've added. I've got a 485, which is a 350 megahertz analog scope. Uh, a 2445 and a 2465, um, that's 150 and another 300 megahertz uh, four-channel scopes. Um, and I also have a 2467, which is a four-channel 300 megahertz scope, 350 megahertz scope that has a what's called a micro plate CRT. Uh, there mm-hmm. were two two or three scopes <laughs> that Tektronix made that had this, this CRT that they called Bright Eye. And um, what the scope had in it was a, an electron multiplier right at the face of the CRT. So that um, when the the beam was swept across, the electrons that hit this electron multiplier would get magnified 10,000 times before it went and lit up the phosphor. And what it gave you was a very, very fast visual writing rate to the point where you could things in in normal room light could see single Mm -hmm. shot events at a nanosecond per division. Okay. And that's basically you could do on an analog scope what you now require a... 
digital storage scope to do to capture those single exactly. shot events. And so there were a couple yep. of scopes, the 2467 and the 7104, which was a, a, a 7000 series with plug-in you know, type of mainframe type scope back then, were the two main scopes that had this micro channel plate CRT. So I got one of those scopes about seven or eight years ago at a ham fest out in Ohio, Dayton, Ohio. So, um, but uh, so, those, those, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, the biggest ham, fe- the biggest ham, fe- uh, ham fest kind of in the world, at least in the U S is, uh, every year in the spring in Dayton, Ohio. Um, yeah. and, uh, so I, I've been out, I've only been out there to it twice, but, uh, there's usually a lot of good stuff to be found out there. So, so those are like the analog scopes that I've got. <laughs> so, I, so I, so it's more than just one, you know. And it, it's like, you know, as you can tell, it's all kind of analog stuff. And I, I kind of love the old analog scopes, as you could probably tell from my my YouTube videos. So, uh, yeah, from your yeah. videos, yes. <laughs> and we should go over no, some of those newfangled digital storage rubbish. <laughs> I like. Hey, they're all good too. Uh, let's go over some of your. I mean, you you have some really cool videos. I mean, we're. Where, where are you getting these ideas for for some of these videos and well, you know, like when... well, that's a good question. I mean, I, the first videos that I put up there uh, were a lot of them were just because of some cool things we did with ham radio. So the the in fact my YouTube channel, you know, is just my my ham radio call sign W two A you know W two A E W. Um, so you know, a couple of videos up there were just due to that, and then usually it came down to like you know maybe somebody in my radio club or or a friend of mine said, hey, you know, how do you do this or what does this mean and, and that kind of thing. And like somebody at the club had asked me, you know, how do you use this you know delayed time base in in this scope that I just got. And uh, I was like, well, hey, let me, well, I don't have the scope here. I said, let me do a video. I'll post it up there. You can go look at it, you know, type of thing. And then, uh, you know, and then that would get viewed. And then sometimes people would, you know, send me comments. It's like, oh, what about this or how to do that? So a lot of it comes from just questions that I've gotten from, you know, other hobbyists. Uh, I'm friends with a lot of folks that do like radio restoration and things like that, like antique radio clubs and things like that. And, you know, somebody will say, well, you know, how does, you know, I don't understand this concept, you know, like, you know, the, the phase relationship between voltage and current through a capacitor for example so i you know so i did a video on that and then then each of these videos a lot of times will generate you know questions that lead to other ideas oh that would be a good thing to do a video on so i've got a list right now probably of about 50 you know other topics you know that you know when i get inspired i'll I'll go go knock one off and go do it and that kind of a thing so um so so as you if you've looked at the my channel it's mostly geared towards kind of the hobbyist slash hacker slash you know somebody beginner you know electronics Mm -hmm. type thing i do have some really cool stuff with some of the latest equipment um and i you know i've got a lot of circuit space stuff i've got some equipment based things but i always try to make it very you know kind of hands-on if i'm going to explain some Mm -hmm. kind of a topic about like you know how a phase lock loop circuit works i'm not just going to talk about it in block Mm -hmm. diagrams i want to build the circuit show it literally show how it works and that kind of thing and illustrate it to try to bring you know kind of that hands-on feel to it so uh, yeah and you can testify how much effort is required to uh, shoot edit and upload one of these well, videos. Well, at least, right? at least two of those things. Because <laughs> you might notice in my videos that there's very oh, little right. editing. Yes, <laughs> you, you bastard. You've got, you've got practically infinite upload well, no, bandwidth no, no. compared well, no, to me. Actually, my, the, no, he said the editing, the editing piece. If you look oh, at my videos, edit- you oh, can sorry, tell that right. there's virtually zero post-processing or editing on my videos. So ah, right, these are yes. stream of consciousness start to finish for the most part. This, yep. You know, shaky cam and everything. Because, I mean, most of my videos, I'm holding the camera in one hand and I'm doing what I'm doing with the other hand. <laughs> you know, and totally so, nuts, yeah. uh, so literally, you know, and the whole idea there is to try to make it feel like, you know, hey, you're sitting in the lab with me, you know, type of thing. And uh, mm-hmm. so I don't have any titling or anything like that. And the only thing that I can really, and well, truthfully, I don't even have any video editing software. I mean, I just downloaded some freeware a couple months ago to allow me to to stitch two you know segments together or cut out something that's <laughs> right. so there's maybe three of my videos have got a section that I had to cut out and merge things together but that's it in terms of post processing for my videos so for me the Sweet. time is to properly plan things out 
uh, to have you know some some diagrams yes. drawn up that yep. makes sense that I can talk through to have a circuit built and to have run through kind of the testing I'm going to do with that circuit to kind of show how it works you know and that so that that, that may mm. take you know anywhere from a half an hour to days to do you know to set something yep. up right um, and then you know the videos my videos most of them are between ten and fifteen mm. minutes long and, and it literally is you know stream of consciousness and uh, again no post processing like yep. if I'm I'm in an eighty year old house and I'm in my basement doing this stuff <laughs> and sometimes my wife will walk around on you know on the first floor and you can hear all the creaky floors being picked up on the microphone on my camera you know, <laughs> it's, 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 I know all about that so, <laughs> but um yeah, mine are pretty much a stream of consciousness too, but I do hit the start stop. Sure. You know, I do the right, I'll just do this little segment and then bang, I just whack right, them all right. together, join them all together later. But yeah, I don't do that planning out stage, which I think you probably do more of at the start. <laughs> just kind I of just go. kind of, yeah. you know. It just kind of yeah, go, just switch on camera yeah, and, and okay. Yeah, and of course the danger something. with that is that, I, you know? and that sometimes I'll find that I upload a video and a week later I'm looking at it. It's like, oh man, that's wrong. <laughs> or, or I, yeah, or that's I, wrong. I miss or this. I miss it. And, oh, that, and that's when you go through some oh, of my videos, you'll yeah. see little. You know, I'll go and put the annotations in. So as you're watching a video, the little <laughs> yeah, block comes right. up. Say, oh, I meant to say this here. You know, <laughs> so, right. so yeah. the videos are loaded <laughs> with those kinds of things too. But that's again, yeah. I don't make my I don't make my living doing this stuff. It's just for fun. So no, that's a. But yeah, as you said, it can take some of those more complicated ones, especially if you've got to set up a breadboard and do everything. You know, it can take oh, yeah. days of, yeah. you know, yeah, it, it can take a day or two. You know, it's not just something you just switch on the camera and bang, yeah, it was, magically and, and happens. And they build on it, each other. Cause I, I had somebody know. asked me once about, you know, mm. what are these other inputs and outputs on the back of the scope? What do I use them for? You know, like, like right. we've got the Z-axis input or the Z-axis input. I'll do it that way. Um, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> but, <laughs> or, you know, some of these other ones. So Z I started here. doing some videos yeah. on that with like doing and uh, like XY mode, listed you patterns, and I did a couple of videos. And that kind of ultimately yeah. led to the one mm -hmm. that was really popular, which was doing some composite video on the scope screen you know yeah, and that's that, right that, that was kind of a follow-on of other videos that i did it's like oh this was fun oh oh let me do this you know and i started going going through it and, and once i did something fun playing around the bench it's like oh i think i'll do a video with that so a lot of the videos came out of just fun that i'm having on my bench playing around and saying yeah same so. here yeah yeah they're not planned at all i'm just doing something and i go oh well, this would make for some interesting content, I think. Maybe some people want to see this. So you switch on yeah. the camera and yes, do I, a and video. Mine are, I'm literally, I, don't even, I don't even have a proper digital video camera. I mean, the, ca the, the, the camera that I <laughs> use is a, a Canon, you know, well, let me look at it here. I've got it right here. It's an SX110IS, which is a, a, you know, a 12x optical zoom, 12 megapixel still camera. Okay, mm -hmm. just a still photo yeah. camera, yep. but it does does a, yeah, it need. does a decent job with video. I use the yeah. microphone that's in it, you know. So, uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, and I, I, like I said, I think I like the feel that it has that way. So I'm just going to continue to do them that way, probably. So it's yeah. all about the content. Content so. is king. Yep. Alan, where do you yeah. see, where do you see uh, scopes going in the future? I mean. I mean, you've been you've been using them for a long time, and now you you see them every day yep. with like how customers are using. Where do where do you think? Where do you think it's all going towards? Is it? Yeah, I mean, it, it's. Yeah, you know, I think the direction is, especially if you compare, you know, over you know the past couple of decades, it's changed dramatically, right? There's a, there's a whole, there's a lot of difference between you know a four channel analog scope from you know the 1980s to you know even the basic digital scopes today. I mean, pe people ask an awful lot more of scopes nowadays than they used to. You know, back then, you know, back, it used to be just a visualization tool, timing measurements, you know, other things like that. And, uh, but it was just to visualize, you know, signal shapes or, and that kind of a thing. And now people are doing compliance measurements to standards, you know, jit jitter decomposition, uh, frequency domain, oh, wow. modulation domain analysis. So I think that's really, you know, where yeah. most of the, you know, the changes are, are be, of just being able to do more and more with the same instrument, you know, and, you know, kind of. To two techs horn a little bit, you know, kind of this, uh, you know, the mixed domain oscilloscope that tech came out with last year is, is a good is a good example of that of being able to tie multiple domains together, and I think you're just going to mm -hmm. see more and more of that, and uh, and that's I think you know, and then and then it's just it's just pushing the envelope in both directions. You're going to see more sophisticated features moving down the food chain into lower cost products, and you're going to see you know the yeah. other end of the food chain moving up, you know, to you know 
hundreds of giga sample per second sample rates for real time scopes and things like that to go you know to the other end of the spectrum. So uh, it's just kind of it's wherever the technology allows you to go nowadays. You know, because the more people can do with fewer pieces of equipment, the happier they'll be. Because especially on the high end, if they're spending you know several yeah. hundred thousand dollars worth no, yeah, for equipment, yeah, they want yeah, to do yeah. as much as possible. So. Yeah, that's right. What are people using the the high the high gig of sample? I mean, like hundred gig of sample, mm-hmm. that kind of sure. crap. Who? What are people using well, that for? Like, what kind of hard app, drives okay. is a big one. Well, hard well hard well is hard it? drives can be, certainly can be they, a big one. They because... use lots of bleeding edge high speed yep. serial scopes. Hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, they use a lot of high-speed yep. serial scopes. They use a lot of uh, very high-speed arbitrary waveform generators to generate these mm-hmm. test waveforms because they're not just digital patterns. <laughs> oh, no. But, no. Uh, exactly. but, the, but the, the, big, you know, like the users for the, the kind of the bleeding edge of these scopes, especially the real-time scopes, are things like, um, you know, there's a lot of military applications, obviously, for things like for oh, radar, yeah. satellite, okay. things like that. But then also a very big one uh, is, re- is a research area in things like high-speed physics research and things mm-hmm. like that, as well as um, high-speed optimization communications because what's it what the interesting uh. thing that we're seeing now is something called coherent optical communications okay and if you think about optical communications kind of up until the last you know half a decade or so uh, people were talking about just it's basically a very simple type of modulation right you're just turning light mm-hmm. on and off Okay, and uh, so it's kind of like it's <laughs> it almost, sounds easy, yeah, that's right? Right? It's sounds easy right? <laughs> but the problem is that you get, it you, done. get you get to the point where that you're you know the, that can only take you so far. So what's happening now is coherent opti- optical communications, where if you think about the well light as a carrier, and you modulate uh-huh. things like amplitude and phase of that carrier. Mm. Whoa. Okay. Make an FM FM light waves. Well, now thing? now people are doing like binary phase shift, FMPM. you know, binary phase shift keying and quadrature phase shift keying. It's kind of like the how the, the modem industry, how yeah, the modem exactly. industry progressed, right? It was yep. very simple stuff at the beginning, three hundred bits per second, and then they yeah. had to squeeze the you know all this advanced modulation stuff sure. into yeah, so that- the bandwidth. Right. So now you're seeing things like you know like dual polarization. You know, quadrature phase shift keyed, you know, optical communications. Oh, so you've with, got with tongue angle, right? Exactly. <laughs> you do have tongue angle because with added you tongue have, angle, folks. You, you've got you can have light at the same, you know, carrier frequency, the same color. Okay, launched yeah. in two different pol- polarizations, a vertical and horizontal polarization <laughs> into the fiber. Okay, each of those polarizations wow. can have like a a QPSK or sixteen QAM modulation on it, <laughs> and then you could add multiple colors. Mm-hmm. Doing the same thing, okay. Really, so you've got frequency division multiplexing, polarization division, you know, changes, and that, so it's kind of it's just a multi-carrier complex. So what's happening is the same <laughs> modulation techniques that have been used for years for RF are now being used for yeah. for light. Okay, and it has fiber. to be because wow. when they string fiber optic between cities and under the oceans, they only string like you know like five of them. You know, three, three or yeah. something. You know, they yeah. they don't string yeah. hundreds of them. So you've got to put. You want to put more more data down there. You yep. you don't up the frequency. You change the modulation, right? Schemes yep. and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, to so put that's more light down, more more information down the same. Uh, right. Fiber. So now we're talking Plus. about. You know, it's yeah. a series of tubes, right. Dave. Hundred plus yeah. gigabit per second type, you know, communication. Uh, Hundred plus. Yeah. Really? So it's, these are so guys like this need to have very very high speed scopes because they need to mm-hmm. capture the in phase and quadrature. Because what happens is they'll take this optical signal, they'll demodulate it, but they demodulate it back to IQ to quadrature data, just like you would do in RF. So you yeah. get an in phase and quadrature right. component. They're using the scope as a very high speed multi channel digitizer, <laughs> okay, and then doing all the math behind that to demodulate. Yeah back down to you know the ones and zeros again so uh but yeah and that is so cool so, and it's here's something a lot of people don't understand but they keep complaining about the scopes all the modern scopes oh they're all running windows and all this sort of stuff well you know they're so advanced and so feature rich you it, it, you're almost as a uh, you know, you don't have to speak for tech, but just mm-hmm. speak in general. Um, that that's the way that the industry is forced to go, really. 
Yeah, because just for getting software yeah, developers. Exactly. Because yeah. all, these scopes are all <laughs> software now. Yeah, the you more know? sophisticated and, you make yeah. those those yeah. processing algorithms, and, the, and that, those are the kind of things that you want. The post processing that you're going to do on the mm-hmm. on the data itself, uh. the more sophisticated that is, you know, the the harder that's going to do to the harder that's going to be to implement into some kind of a closed operating system. Yeah. Okay. Or, you so, know, firmware yeah. written in assembly, right. so it's all fast and slick, like yeah. scopes oh, yeah. Are, yeah. are supposed to work. You know. Right. Um, so there's more and more yeah. that's pushed into you know into firmware and things like that. You know, to do more kind of real time, fast hardware based processing. Mm. But the, but you're limited in flexibility of what you can do there. Uh, so exactly. So you want to, and you know, the PC hardware stuff is fast enough that you can actually once you get down to that point, you can do a lot of this. Mm. You know, sophisticated post processing in you know, at least Windows-driven applications. I mean, a lot of times, yep. the more sophisticated equipment will have a PC in them to run the UI, but they'll yes. also have, you know, maybe mm-hmm. a power PC or other Steve. types of processors mm-hmm. that do a lot of the hardcore number crunching that you don't have access right. to, but the UI drives it or talks to it. Yep. So, yeah. Right. And that's, and yeah, that's, that's pretty really much cool. the uh, price we pay for wanting all this high-end yeah, uh, software functionality on our yeah. scopes, really. Yeah, it's, so, it's not a green worm know. on a screen anymore. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in the other direction, what about? Um, so, I mean, there's all this high end yep. stuff, yep. right? And, but what about f- from? I guess this would be a hybrid of you know your work and also your your ham mm-hmm. stuff and just your hobby yeah. stuff. What do you think? What do you think is the best scope for someone to start with and maybe is accessible? I mean, we're. Uh, I'm guessing it's a textbook, loaded question. It is. Rather than break it down by brand, let's first just talk about type. I mean, to me, mm-hmm. because you know I'm a very hands-on guy, I like to get a good feel for how things work. I'm always I'm mm-hmm. you know I'm maybe I'm I'm old, but I'm very partial <laughs> to you know the analog scopes because I think that gives you a much more analog, closer to the hardware what's going on feel Mm -hmm. okay there are certainly a lot of things i mean that's true many many things that you can't do with an analog scope but well i i posted a forum question (laughs) where i i I listed literally a dozen different things that an analog scope cannot do that you can do on a basic 400 hundred dollar digital right yeah i mean you know pre-trigger data storing single shot captures all the list goes on forever but (laughs) yeah but you know what you've never taken a polaroid of a digital scope before dave (laughs) but that's the funny thing when i first got out of college my first job you know we didn't have digital scopes we had the the polaroid scope cameras and one of the rites of passage when you got into the lab is that someone would come up to you in your face with that scope camera and take a picture and hang on the wall <laughs> and hanging on the wall were little curly polaroid photos of everybody that worked in that lab that was like a big nose oh that's you know, great it was, a, it was a big nose and the eyes yeah. set really far back everybody looks like a horse but the, everybody had one of those photos <laughs> you know. do you have it still? I, I probably have it packed away you... in a box somewhere but uh, oh you so, gotta get that so, man. but yeah, uh, it's gold. but but uh, but yeah you're right i mean there's certainly things that you know i mean mm. that you can do with today's digital scopes but i guess part of the issue is 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 that I'm, you know, I, I'm a big, you know, proponent of understanding the fundamentals, and uh, and one of the things that I, right. you know, that I see is that, and it's a good thing and a bad thing, is that you know a lot of folks that are especially hobbyists that are getting into electronics today are getting in like with Arduinos and things like that, and and mm-hmm. they're, you know they're blinking an LED within a half an hour of opening the box, because, you know, being able to do this, they're actually making hardware do something, but um, but. Which, Which is, is awesome, yeah. and I think and I think that's great because it just gets people excited about building things and making things. But it also kind of short circuits or it goes around some of the fundamentals. So uh, mm. you know, how do you bias a transistor? Okay, and and how do yeah. you get a feel for what circuits are doing? And I think there's value in both of those. And I and I I'll put myself yeah. more in the analog fundamentals camp than I am on the you know the the microcontroller camp. I've never really done any work with my micro, microcontrollers myself. Okay, but I think there's a lot of value in that. I just I, I hate to see people lose sight of some of those fundamentals because that's and the kind that's of that's why I always recommend go get yourself a beginner. Which scope do I get? Well, go and get. A, you know, a 20 megahertz yeah. dual channel analog, and they're yeah. free. Yeah, that's right. the advantage. You can, you can get them from practically yeah. free. Right, you can, and and, and that's yeah. a good thing because then you under you start to learn the fundamentals. And I remember I was talking with a, a, a kind of a relatively new engineer, and we we're talking about scopes and just basic usage, and you know, a couple of different things. And I said, well, I said, well, if you turn this, you know, I remember saying something like, well, if you turn the sweep speed up and you, to see this, and they said, well, what's a sweep speed? Well, on oh, the new digital yeah, scopes, it's right. not sweep speed; yeah. it's horizontal scale. Exactly. Okay, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> and, that's, and that's the kind of you know. So, 
I, I think there's, there's a lot of value in understanding those fundamentals and what a scope is showing you, what you're asking it to do and what it's showing yeah. you. And then you can better understand and better take advantage of the things that a digital scope can do for you. There's an, there, there's yeah. an interview question, folks. Trap for young players, you know. <laughs> What's the sweep speed of a scope? You know? Right. <laughs> Pass or fail, right here. Well, and even folks. triggering right. too, right? Tr- triggering is a very important concept yeah, of both. Right? Oh, yeah. And and I and I think in uh, analog scope, you realize that no, no, this is actually like a comparator. I mean, this is like it is firing an electron in order to actually you know capture yeah. this waveform. And and you don't really get that in a digital scope. It's just a line that moves on a screen, well, yeah, right? It's yeah, like, and, eh, but the thing eh, is, eh. and and you, once you go beyond that, you know. The triggering in a digital scope is infinitely better than what you can do in an analog scope mm. because because of, right, of the right. capture capability and being able to trigger on different conditions and things like that. But but the understanding that concept of why it's called a trigger and what it means, yeah. right? What what it you helps you to do. You need an analog. You need right. to go back. Yeah. So yeah. So I I always I yeah. like to have people you know you know understand the fundamentals, see where this is coming from, and then decide mm-hmm. what features you need in a digital scope based on the work you're doing. If you're doing a lot of high-speed serial work, mm-hmm. you might need to do single-shot captures of multiple channels to do some decoding. You know, yep. Depending on what you're doing, that will help you decide what, what type of a scope you need. But like I said, it's almost a no-cost mm-hmm. freebie thing to pick yourself up an older analog scope, whether it's tech- Tektronix or somebody else, because they all basically work about the yeah. same way. Oh, know, yeah. 90% of the ones that are out there are, you know, especially nowadays, are are triggered uh, scopes because you know before triggered scopes there were the recurrent sweep scopes which are far mm-hmm. less useful but oh, there's no, there's no yeah. yeah and there's there's almost no excuse now if you're going to buy an analog scope to buy some anything other than a triggered sweep scope oh, of course okay and then that's uh, a given right mm-hmm. and like i said you can get them for you know all, many times free or you know tens or twenties of dollars you know yeah. type of thing yeah. and learn yeah about, mostly right, shipping and, right? and then, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah and then you know learn about what it does for you and how to use it how to get the most out of it and then go decide okay i know i need this feature this feature and this feature and then go shopping for the next scope so now the other Do, are you a uh okay chris after you david no no no, no please, mine's a technical please, question sorry. which could take some time <laughs> All right. Well, mine oh, is too. Well, so okay. anyway, uh, <laughs> so uh, are, are, are you are, are you a uh, Jim Williams oh. style fanatic? Are you are you rebuilding? Are you a, a scope builder am, as well? I'm absolutely a huge apart, fan of Jim Williams, and 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 I was also a huge fan of uh, of Bob Pease, um, and uh, right. you know, and uh, I I met Jim Williams twice. And uh, and we had oh, really? you know, we had some really great conversations. He was he was just doing one of his like high speed amplifier seminars or something, and that I'd gone to years ago. But uh, remember, we had some conversations, yeah. and uh, it's funny we actually started talking about scopes one day um, because a lot of his stories kind of relate back to them. And uh, uh, yeah. if he said that the first scope that he used when he was at MIT was a Allen B. Dumont cathode ray oscillograph. So it's just kind of what <laughs> we had. But, um, <laughs> yes. but he, he also yeah. related a great story. And it, uh, and I, I don't know if it's something you've talked about here before or not, but it, it appears as one of the chaps in his book. And it would also it appeared as an editorial in uh, EDN News or one of those or something like one of the electronic rags. Uh, it was entitled, Should mm-hmm. Ohm's Law Be Repealed? Oh, oh yes, right. yeah, have you read it? And, that, and that's—I don't know if we've talked about no, it. Yeah, yet, but, and, well. and it's a, and it's a great story. What it talks about is when, what Jim Williams was growing up. Um, he lived next door to this doctor. I think it was Doctor Stern was his name, who was also an electronic hobbyist, and he had an older tech scope um, there, and that and I don't remember the model number now, but. And, you know, Jim would go over there and play with circuits and build things and look at things on the scope. And, and the scope was also, you know, this you know, a work of art, you know, some of these, these older mm. tech scopes, the way they were built and things oh, like yeah. that. So the boards but, are just gorgeous. But he, he remembers go, you know, going through and looking at the circuit and it was doing some weird things. Like he, it, would, it would do something weird. It pro, voltage readings weren't making sense. Waveforms weren't making sense, you know, and that kind of a thing. And I guess this Dr. Stern kind of looked over his shoulder and kind of moistened a couple of fingers and touched a couple of spots <laughs> in the board and then judicially soldered in a couple of puffs of capacitance between two nodes and the circuit started working. And you know, <laughs> and the story was that you know, Jim's like, what did you do? What did you figure out? And uh, as the doctor explained to him, he said, well, I figured that the circuit was probably oscillating at several hundred megahertz, you know, beyond what the scope can show you. Okay, and uh, and just by you know putting a little bit of capacitance in, I could dampen out the oscillation with my fingers. We soldered you know, some capacitance in there to kind of quen- you know, squelch it, and everything worked fine. And you know Jim's reaction was like, 
well, that's not fair, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? The scope should show me what's going on. And it's, a, and it's really a great lesson in mm. understanding the limitations of your tools, mm. right? Because mm-hmm. yeah. every data yeah. sheet, whether, what, no matter what tool you're using, whether it's a scope or a circuit simulator or anything else, the, the manuals and everything will tell you everything that the thing can do. But they, they don't tell you what it can't do. Can't do. Yep. Okay. All exactly. right. And if you don't, and if you don't understand the limitations of those tools, the tools are going to lie to you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. You've got to be smart enough to recognize the lie. I mean, just like that one with the scope, you know, the one I tell people, you know, with uh, when you think about it, like a circuit simulator, like mm-hmm. LT Spice has got no problems putting a thousand amps through a one N nine fourteen diode. Yeah, exactly. yeah, right. <laughs> I had a twenty kilovolt signal on my right, screen the right. other day. It was awesome. Yeah. So it, it doesn't know you let. <laughs> That's the, what I was going to hook up. Right, it doesn't let. It doesn't know that you let the smoke out of the part. Right. <laughs> so so you got to. Yeah. It's, it's just as just as and sometimes even more important to understand the limitations of the tools or how you use the tools okay so you don't get lied yeah. to yep. you know and right. that, and that's another again probably another good reason for analog scopes okay <laughs> because if you can under, it's a simple enough instrument for people to understand how it works mm-hmm. and it's ver- very unlikely that it's going to lie to you about something <laughs> well, other than yeah, go ahead i made this when we were talking about this the other day and i listed those things that a digital scope can do that an analog scope can't do i also pointed out that analog scopes can lie will not lie to you but not show you but you can miss stuff on an analog yes. scope as well if yes. you don't turn that brightness all the way up and get that little faint little runt pulse mm-hmm. in there yeah, you, you the can precision. miss sure. it right yep. just yep. like you can absolutely on a digital scope yep. so they're, it, they're, they're yes. not magic either there's limitations again, it, it, it's, everywhere it's, it's, it's understanding those limitations, yep. and that, and that, no matter what the tool is, whether it's a screwdriver, or a mm-hmm. scope, a spectrum analyzer, or a simulator, they all have limitations mm-hmm. in terms of what they can and can't do. And it's just as important to understand those limitations <laughs> as it is to uh, to understand what it can do. I- are you allowed to give these talks to your customers? I, I have to ask. Because <laughs> I, I have to say, if, if it was me and I was having a bad day, I'd be like, well, you know, there's just limitations in the scope. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, is you know, you know every, every tool has got limitations. And that's the thing, you, you know, as an application engineer, you know, I'll go through and, and describe, hey, we can do this, you can't do that. You're asking to do something that can't be done this way or that way because of whatever it is. Right. Every tool has limits. Because of physics. Because, because of physics, right? We can't violate the laws of physics. Yeah. You, can, you can't probe a signal without affecting it in some small way. Sometimes it's not such yep. a small way. Okay. Bloody Heisenberg, so, you know. Right, right. So, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so it, it, it's all about understanding those limitations and the impact of doing of, of what you're doing and how much it's going to matter or not. So, mm. but, uh, mm. oh. uh, one, one thing we've been talking about recently on the forum is a couple of new scopes now on the market are going back to low sensitivity, uh, uh, low vertical sensitivities, like 500 mm-hmm. microvolts right. per division. And yeah. a lot of people are complaining, well, why is there a million? Look, there's a whole division of noise on there. Yeah. You know, and uh, can you explain why that's the case and why that's so difficult over bandwidth to get yeah, these low absolutely. sensitivities? Sure. And, that, and that's the way to think about that is that, uh, like, if, if, if you've ever held your, you know, your hand to your ear to, to hear something a little bit better, right? What you're doing is trying to cut out noise or signals from other areas okay Mm -hmm. so the same concept with you know an oscilloscope you got to figure an oscilloscope is a wide band device okay Mm -hmm. even a a 20 megahertz scope 100 megahertz scope gigahertz bandwidth scope and the The more you pay for it yes the wider a bandwidth the wider the bandwidth it is so the the wider bandwidth (laughs) you have the more you you basically have got you know noise exists at every frequency Okay, mm-hmm. so and ideally, if you're ampl- you know, you, you've got a, a preamp sitting behind that front panel connector, so it's got an amplifier that's got bandwidth that ex- you know that's equal to or greater than the bandwidth of your scope. Okay, mm-hmm. so it's going to amplify noise at every frequency, and it's going to add a little bit of its own depending on what its noise figure is. Okay, so the more bandwidth you have, the more noise you have because you essentially could have you know, even a 50 ohm resistor has got noise. Broadband noise, let alone okay. a one meg ohm input impedance, right. folks. Right, exactly. So, which is a regular so scope. Right. So, uh, the wider the bandwidth you have, the more total noise you're going to have, and that's why if you hit the bandwidth limit on the scope from 100 megahertz down to 20, that that noise goes down, right? Mm-hmm. Because now you're listening with less bandwidth. Okay, uh, so uh, it's a concept that's that 
regular users of spectrum analyzers un mm. understand very well. You reduce resolution bandwidth and the noise floor drops. But scope users generally don't think about that. It's like, well, I yep. want to have you know a, a scope with you know three gigahertz of bandwidth, and I want you know 100 microvolts worth of noise. Well, you, <laughs> you, you don't get that, right? Exactly. So and I want a pink pony, right? right. So, <laughs> and but, a flying um, unicorn, <laughs> right? Yep. So, and so it's really it really comes down to the fact you can have low noise amplifiers and all this kind of thing, but at the end of the day, there is no perfect noiseless device. A resistor creates noise. Oh, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and, and that is just going to happen. And the more bandwidth you have, the more noise you have. So, uh, and, that, and that's the higher kind of the fun input impedance, reason. the more noise you have. So, Je yes, exactly. As the so, value of the input resistance goes yep. up, the higher your noise goes up. Yep. QKTR, whatever that formula is. Yeah, for the, the uh, Johnson noise. noise yep. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. So, but yeah, there's no getting around uh, the physics unless you bring everything down to super cool temperatures and that kind of stuff to mm -hmm. minimize that. So, take the temperature part of that equation down. So, so be thankful you're getting 500 microvolts per division capability, folks. Right. Yeah, Don't bitch about is, it. Well, if you filter the crap out of it, you yeah, may be okay, a right? Or pile of averaging and things like that. You may be able to get it down, that yeah, kind of a thing. Well, so, you uh, can yeah. use the high high res mode these days, yes. which which implements the on-the-fly averaging, yeah. you know, yeah. between like four samples or ten samples or something. So. Yeah, as long as, long as you're long as you not looking at a signal that needs the full sample rate, absolutely. Yes, yep. exactly. So... Ah, one last question, because we're <laughs> sure. way over time. Okay. Um, it, it's on the scope theme again, a yeah. lot of people, and I, <laughs> I think I was going to actually shoot a video on this and trying to explain why I get so many people bitching about these scopes and why they have software. Uh, so you know, they they charge more for what is effectively a software option. You know, they'll right. charge yep. more for. Um, you know, sample memory, they'll charge more for serial decode. They'll charge more <laughs> for bandwidth. Like, you know, the bandwidth is built in the scope and they'll software limit it yeah. back. Yeah. And I'm trying to explain to them that, you know, if companies can afford to keep people on staff and do leading edge R&D, you have to make money on this higher end margin yeah. products. And if you just follow the race to the bottom mm -hmm. and sell, you know, a one gig uh Bandwidth scope with all the bells and whistles in decoding for four hundred right. <laughs> bucks. Yeah, the industry won't exist. Yeah, and, and so, that's true. And well, you're right. I mean, I, when take I was on, on that? well, I'll put it this way: when I was on the other side, when I was a customer for twenty mm -hmm. years before joining Tektronix, I, w I was in that same camp. It's like. There's just a, it's just changing a digit in this access code turns on this option. It's already there. Why can't I have it? You know, <laughs> right so I, was, I was in that same camp. You know, but you know, and I I, I certainly understand the argument. But uh, but like I said, on the other hand, all there is a lot of NRE that went into developing that. Okay, yeah. and and if you don't. You know, if someone doesn't pay for that, it the next the next new project and the next mm -hmm. advanced feature doesn't happen. So it's really about paying for the right. value that you get. But the one thing I should mention, well, the too, other option is every as everyone pays more, yeah. right? I mean, it's just the the base model of it right. is, just goes up. Yeah, but right. the other thing I, I also you know think about too is that especially if we we have to be careful about how we apply this to things like a bandwidth upgrade. Okay, mm. because a lot of times in and the thing I when I, I cringe sometimes when people say, oh, yeah, I found a hack to turn this 100 megahertz scope into a 200 megahertz scope. The the thing that they're not <laughs> taking into account there is that, you know, when that scope is configured as a 200 megahertz scope at the factory, it may go through a different calibration process to level flat and calibrate that channel mm -hmm. for 200 megahertz. And mm -hmm. if you just turn the bandwidth up. You, you you don't have the benefit of the calibration of that channel at, at that frequency, so you may not get the the flatness and things like that. Possibly, that you yep. might. It, it depends on who how they architected the scope, what they did, and that kind of That's a thing. Right. But uh, it's it's one of those unknown things that uh, if you take your 50 megahertz scope and turn it into a 100 megahertz scope, is it going to be flat out? You know, is it going to have the right response? Okay, we don't know that, right? But uh, so, uh, it, but people can do what they want with mm. their own equipment, of course, but. And yeah, so yeah. it is a necessary part of the industry. They have to do this. Yep. Yeah. Really, for companies to exist and companies to innovate. Right. Because it, it, if you don't do that, you know, you no companies would make any money and they'd all be selling, you know, one hung low brand scopes for the lowest possible cost and nobody would implement any new features. Right. Yep. <sighs> Yeah, as it is, yeah. it is frustrating from the customer yep. standpoint, and I was the same way. It's like, ah, oh, yep. it's there. I just don't want to turn <laughs> it on. You know, <laughs> so, 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 so button push there. away. I know. Yep. <laughs> yep. Oh, boy, so. but it's tough. It's tough business. Nope. Yeah, yeah. To be in from a scope manufacturer point of view, right? But I mean, what 
we get these days, sorry, we'll finish up in a second, what we get these days for a, uh, you know, for 400 bucks or like sub thousand dollars is sort of, you know, the, yeah. you know, most people can afford like a sub thousand um, dollar scope. And what you, you know, I can remember paying yeah. my first scope. I paid like eight, nine hundred dollars for a 20 megahertz dual yeah. channel analog, sure. right? It didn't even yeah. have delayed time base. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah, what, what you can get for under a thousand bucks now is just insane it's amazing and it's so, one of those things that uh, you're getting a tool that has so much capability you know it, mm. it gets harder and harder especially from a very beginner to understand all the things it can do and how it's doing it and you again run the risk mm. of of asking the scope to lie to you because you may <laughs> yeah. not understand all the things it's doing <laughs> be careful you young players out there <laughs> oh boy well we're way over Thank you very much for joining us, Alan. Oh, it was great. Great fun. I'm cer- certainly glad awesome. that you, you asked me. Thank you. Alan, where can uh, people find you? I, I, I want to hear you say the name of your website. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, they can find me on Twitter, of course. I'm Alan at Tech on Twitter. Um, That's uh, T-E-K, folks, as yes. in Techtronics. You can That's also right. find yeah, me right. on uh, on YouTube. As you mentioned, my YouTube channel is my call, W2AEW. Uh, but then I know the one that Chris wants me to talk about is my, my personal website, which is just kind of a little bit of a joke. I haven't updated it in a while, but it's www.dorkage.com. <laughs> That's a great D- address. D- I love D-O-R-K-A-G-E. it. D-O-R-K-A-G-E. <laughs> Someone once you know, kind of looked in my room with all my equipment and wires and ham radio stuff and said – Man, Dork. that's a lo- that's a lot of dorkage. It's like, <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna see if that domain's that's... available, and it was. And I, I picked up the domain. I don't know how many years ago, but uh, that that was like yeah. the best 1995 a year I spent on the dorkage.com. So it's... <laughs> and then uh, yeah, and you've got the you're rocking the uh, the GeoCities look. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, when I first did that website, literally the first version of the website was a a a, a HTML coded in like Notepad. Oh, yeah. Be yeah. Nice. So, done that. That's the way to and, do and it. And actually, I'll tell you right now, I mean, I don't update the, the site very often, but the tool that I use to update is is Adobe PageMill. Now, how old is that? <laughs> okay, so, I, don't know, I don't even know what that is. So Adobe PageMill <laughs> is probably from, I don't know, like like 2000 or something like that. Or, ah, you know, that's 2001. recent. Oh, come on. Maybe even earlier. Yeah, I don't right. know. It's, it's, it's an old program. But I was, it was this millennium, it was, right? it was on Windows 98 <laughs> when I first did it. So that. So. Nice. <laughs> so. Nice. <laughs> oh, my. Wow, that's great. I, I really enjoyed hearing about all these, uh, all the scope stuff and, and the ham stuff, too. I mean, that's always interesting because yeah, you know, I, I should be getting into it more. But It's, it's a, one you know. of those things. It, 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 it could offer so much, and it's just a matter of you get out of it what you yeah. put into it. And it could, there are so many different aspects to it. We yeah. could do a whole other show on that. So, mm-hmm. but, uh, Yeah. Well, great. Right. Well, we'll definitely see you on Twitter, okay. and hopefully, I'll get to catch you at, at Dayton oh, this year. Oh, uh, yeah. Ho- ho- hopefully, I get to, are you going to go out to Dayton this year? I hope so. If it's not made, if it's not the same as Maker Fair this year, I'll, I'll okay. Great. Be there. I know my wife and I were talking about going out, and because um, she, you know, we've talked about it as long as we've been together, and um, we've never gone out, or I've never gone out since we've been together. We've been married almost four years, but uh, but she's she's looking forward to going out there too. So hopefully, we can what? make that happen this year. Yep, the, what, that's the, awesome. That's a keeper she, right there. Yeah, yeah so yeah, she's she's. I not, don't she, understand this. What? Well, hey, she, she, she's she's not technical at all, but she's you know 100 percent supportive of what I do, because uh, she knows if if she if I'm not you know sitting watching TV with her, I'm downstairs melting solder. I'm upstairs playing mm. on the radio. So it's right. yeah, you know, she so knows where I am and she supports what I do and and you know she's she's fantastic. So it's um everybody should have somebody that's, that's as, great. as great as that. So terrific. <laughs> All right, thanks, Alan. Okay, great. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Catch man. you next time. All right, take care.